OpenAI is finally starting to roll out its voice assistant feature for ChatGPT, which had been previously teased and then delayed uh, due to addressing some potential safety concerns. So the company is making this feature available to a small group of paid ChatGPT Plus customers, and it is going to eventually be rolling this out to all ChatGPT Plus users. Now, this voice assistant has four preset voices. Uh, and in response to copyright concerns, OpenAI has made sure it is going to prevent those voices from uh, doing any impersonations of specific individuals. We had a little bit of controversy with that right around the release of the or the announcement of this feature. And they're also implementing features to prevent the generation of copyrighted audio content, such as music. Now, if you recall, we actually covered this feature when it was initially showcased in May as part of the GPT-40 update announcement, which enhanced the model's ability to handle text, audio, and images in real time. So the company at the time had initially kind of planned to release the voice feature in late June, but then they postponed it. They said there were safety measures and improvements that they needed to make before unleashing this on the broader world. So... We are going to gradually see people getting access to this as we get into the fall here. However, there are some features that were demoed during the initial event, like video and screen sharing capabilities that appear to still be in development without a set launch date. So, Paul, first up, like what have been kind of your initial thoughts of this new and improved voice mode? You know, the initial demos are pretty interesting, either from things you've seen that users with access have been posting or kind of your own experience so far. Yeah, the demo was certainly impressive back in May. And the question is always with these demos is how, how good is it really going to be when we actually get the product? And I have seen people posting videos that I, I would say are somewhat shocking in how good this thing is. So um, if you haven't seen these videos, the, the thing is able to change its tone, inflection, accent, integrate sound effects into its voice, convey emotion, continue when it's interrupted, you stop it and immediately picks back up. It's somewhat uncanny, like how human-like it is. And the more I see these examples, the harder time I have believing that the current model, this 4.0 model that we're all using in ChatGPT is actually what's powering this thing. Um, it just seems like it has way more capability than anything we've interacted with before. So I, I want to rewind back for a minute to May 13th, 2024, when OpenAI published their Hello GPT 4.0 article. And so this was introducing the model, Mike, as you were kind of highlighting. So I'm going to read a few excerpts from this, and I want to add a little context as to why I think we're seeing something maybe more significant than what people realize is happening. So these are the excerpts. I'm just going to kind of read from this. So it says, we're announcing GPT-40. Again, this is May 13th, 2024. Our new flagship model that can reason across audio, vision, and text in real time. <clears throat> GPT-40, the O stands for Omni, is a step towards much more natural human-computer interaction. It accepts as input any combination of text, audio, image, and video, <clears throat> and generates any combination of text, audio, and image outputs. When we get into the voice component, it said it can respond to audio inputs in as little as 232 milliseconds, with an average of 320 milliseconds, which is similar to human response time in a conversation. Um, said GPT-4 was especially better at vision and audio understanding compared to existing models. Prior to GPT-4.0, and this is explaining how the voice model is able to do what it's doing. <clears throat> Prior to GPT-4.0, you could use voice mode to talk to chat GPT. So you and I can go in right now, we can talk to chat GPT but we don't have this new version. So it's saying the one that all of us have um, and have been using, uh, talk to ChatGPT with latencies of 2.5 seconds when you were using the GPT 3.5 model and 5.4 seconds for GPT-4 on average. So way slower, obviously, than 232 milliseconds. Mm. To achieve this, and this is why it takes five seconds, Voice mode in a, is a pipeline of three separate models, 
So when you and I talk to Chad GPT, and I would imagine this is probably kind of how Surrey works. I haven't really thought about that, but how, historically how these voice models have worked. So one simple model transcribes the audio to text. So you and I speak, Chad GPT turns that audio into text. So there's a model to do that. GPT 3.5 or 4 takes it in text and outputs text. And then a third simple model converts the text back to audio. So there was three models that were running behind the scenes to do a single response to your query, basically. This process means that the main source of intelligence, GPT-4, loses a lot of information. It can't directly observe tone, multiple speakers, background noises. It can't output laughter, singing, or express emotion. So they're very clearly explaining the limitations of prior voice technology, basically. With GPT-4.0, it says we trained a single new model end-to-end -end across text, vision, and audio, meaning that all inputs and outputs are processed by the same neural network. Because GPT-4.0 is our first model combining all these modalities, we're just scratching the surface of exploring what the model can do and its limitations. And then it talks about how they've gone through extensive red teaming. Now, again, this was back in May. And what we now know is they went through a lot more red teaming since May to bring this mm. to market. Um, had experts in domains such as social psychology, bias and fairness, and misinformation to identify risks that are introduced or amplified by newly added modalities. We use these learnings to build safety. Um, then it goes on to say, we recognize that GPT-4O's audio modalities present a variety of novel risks. Today, we are publicly releasing, and again, this is in May, publicly releasing text and image inputs and text outputs. So when they announced GPT-40 in May, so the model was done, they only actually made available text and image inputs and outputs. So the audio and the vision capabilities were not released in May, even though they were obviously done. Over the upcoming weeks and months, we'll be working on technical infrastructure, usability via post training, and safety necessary to release the other modalities. For example, at launch, audio outputs will be limited to a selection of preset voices, which is exactly what you just outlined, Mike, and will abide by our existing safety policies. We will share further details addressing the full range of modalities in a forthcoming system card. Um, the capabilities will be rolled out iteratively with extended red teaming. So here's what I can't shake, Mike. When we think about what is GPT-5, and it's like everybody just keeps waiting for it, the more I think about this, the more I think we're already seeing it. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you piece together everything that OpenAI has released or talked about over the last you know, six months in particular, we have video with Sora. We have voice, which we're now experiencing. The image generation, Dolly's kind of a joke when you compare it to mid-journey right now, but my guess is it won't be when they release the next version of Dolly. We have Project Strawberry. We have like whatever that is, math, reasoning, whatever it is. The ability to solve more complex problems, go through reasoning, assist in decisioning. We have search, which was we talked about on last week's episode. We have vision, which they haven't talked more about yet, but the ability for your device to see and understand the world around it. They have already previewed basically all the modalities that are talked about in the 4.0 announcement in May is individual pieces. But when you put those pieces together, and this would fit with the iterative deployment that Sam Altman has talked about, I think that we already have a pretty clear picture of what GPT-5 is going to be. And I think 4.0 is literally just a naming convention until all the pieces are in place. And then once we go back, so let's go back one more time and, and read that opening. Um, GPT-4.0 is a step towards much more natural human computer interaction. It accepts as any input or as input any combination of text, audio, image, and video, and generates any combination of text, audio, and image outputs. Take that, give it advanced reasoning capabilities, give it the ability to see and understand the world around it, and I think you have GPT-5. Mm. And so that's the thing that I can't shake is like the voice on its own is just mind blowing when you, I mean, truly, like if you haven't seen these and I don't say that lightly, like I don't usually use hyperbole when I'm explaining these technologies, like the, it really is hard to comprehend the impact a technology like this 
could have on business, on marketing, on our personal lives. And so when you look at what OpenAI is doing and you actually compare it over to what Google is doing, I think it becomes quite clear that Google and OpenAI are in, in a realm all their own right now. So mm -hmm. yes, Anthropic matters and yeah, 3.5 Sonnet's awesome, but last I checked, like Claude's still not connected to the internet. It doesn't do images. I haven't heard anything about vision stuff with them. Um, so they're doing reasoning, they're doing language models really well, but it doesn't seem like they're playing in the same ballpark. And everything we're seeing from Google and everything we're seeing from OpenAI seems like they're differentiating themselves in this pursuit of whatever this smarter form is going to be. And then the last note I had is also this week, and we'll have a little bit more of a link to this in the newsletter, but Apple Intelligence started rolling out to select users. Developers, I think, um, have started getting access to that. And so people are starting to now experiment with the new Surrey um that is being talked about so we touched on this let's see episode 102 on june 12th we talked about apple intelligence and the new operating system that's going to come out in october isn't that last week we said it's it got delayed till october yeah and so i the thing i like when i see this open ai voice capability the thing i immediately think about is that siri is just going to be obsolete like it doesn't appear like if so, if you fast forward a month or two from now, and all of us can have access to this OpenAI voice capability, why would I ever open Surrey again? Yeah, right. Like if I can just go, like it just seems like it's so far ahead. And so I was asking myself this question as I was prepping for today's podcast: like, what would I use Surrey for? Like, if it really does this stuff. And so I went back and just took a look at how Apple was describing Surrey. Because if you remember, Apple's doing a deal with OpenAI to integrate ChatGPT, but it, it didn't sound like they were integrating the voice technology. And so I think the play Apple's going to have to make here is accept that someone probably built the better voice assistant, the thing they always envisioned building. I think OpenAI just is going to win at that. Hmm. And the Apple intelligence component is Surrey has is your trusted assistant that works within your device that you know, keeps everything completely private and has access to all of your apps. And it becomes more of like an on-device AI agent that enables you to work with all of your uh, applications. So if you go to the Apple intelligence page, it, it literally says like, um, Surrey has all new design that's even more deeply integrated into the system experience. Uh, it has expansive product knowledge, so it knows all about your phone and everything within it. It has a richer understanding and enhanced voice communicating ability, but it talks about on-screen awareness. So Surrey is going to know everything you're doing on your screen. OpenAI won't have that. It'll know everything you've communicated, the personal context. OpenAI won't have that. It'll seamlessly take action across apps. OpenAI won't have that. Hmm. And so that's what I start to wonder is like, can Apple successfully delineate this on-device AI agent that that knows you and everything within it, and that's how you're going to use that. And then there's a separate voice thing that doesn't have access to all your apps and doesn't know what you're doing on your thing, on your devices. So it's just going to be it's going to be fascinating once we get both of these by October. So I assume Apple Intelligence Surrey will be readily available to everyone with an iPhone 15 Pro and above, and I assume Voice from OpenAI will have rolled out and be done with all the red teaming by October. And so this fall, it it's just going to be a different world where voice becomes maybe like heads toward a true user interface. Like we've never really had it, had that. So we had computers with keyboard and mouse. We had touch with different devices. And now we're moving into a generation where voice truly becomes an interface. And that's going to be wild. Yeah. And voice, it strikes me more than any of the other interfaces really is natural and anthropomorphizes almost the models we're interacting yeah. with. Yeah, I mean, I it's so weird, like AI rights activists, like I think you're going to see that become mm. a thing. I've thought about this recently, the situational awareness stuff. When I was listening to Leopold in interviews, I, I thought about this idea of AI rights activists. I, I'm not going to lie. Like when I was watching, like Ethan Mollick had a demo. I think Allie Miller, I watched a demo of her with OpenAI's voice where they interrupt it kind of rudely while it's talking, mm -hmm. I get the same feeling in my stomach I do when someone does that to another human. And like, yeah. and I know it's an AI, but I have, I have feeling toward that. Like I have an emotion that's triggered in me when someone talks rudely to someone 
And it happens when I see people doing it to these. And I get that same feeling about like when someone mistreats an animal, like mm. I, I know that may sound weird and I don't know if I'm like alone on this, but it, it's going to be a problem. Like it's very bizarre how you do, as you're saying, like you start to just like assign human like qualities to these things, even though we know it's not there. <laughs> 